So I'm just going to hand it over directly over to Fausto, who's here with us from Reach, and, and obviously Francesco, you know from the GPC. Um, I am Lisa. I'm also with the GPC. I will be a silent participant, but maybe I can invite those of you who are here already, if you could just put your name uh, and where you work in the chat, and I'll hand it over to my two colleagues. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, uh, or good morning. Uh, I'm Fausto Espiga. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm the Protection Assessment Specialist at Rich. I'm very pleased to be here uh, today presenting. And together with me are my two colleagues, Mario and uh, Soledad. Um, over to Francesco. Thank you, Fausto. I will be very quick. <laughs> Well, my name is Francesco Michele. Uh, I'm uh, the analysis lead for the Global Protection Cluster. Um, I will just spend a couple of minutes just to introduce the, the objective of this webinar, and then I hand it over to our great colleagues from REACH. Um, a bit the objective of this webinar is, I don't know how many of you has been in past webinar, but we have been spending the last six months together with the all area of responsibility to actually revise the overall approach of protection analysis and then contribution to HNOs from the protection cluster. One of the major aspects of this process has been really looking deeply into harmonizing well data and information to ensure that we have a much more collaborative work to avoid data fatigues from, uh, for, for the people we serve and specifically actually build on the added value of uh, uh, each of us uh, in the term of partners, our responsibility and cluster, and then colleagues like REACH uh, data providers that, of course, uh, are fundamental for our work. Um, the overall goal uh, of this session, I mean, I'm really thank you to Fausto, Mario, and so that, um, is to actually use this opportunity to look into between now and moving forward on the best way to collaborate. We think that there are untapped opportunities, and also we also think that with the new approach that we have been working on in the last six months, we have even more opportunity to work together and make the best of uh, reach capacity and also reach benefit from all our expertise and the way we move forward. So without delaying this too much, um, I really invite everyone to be frank, uh, to it's an open conversation and uh, leave the space to the colleagues of REACH to do the presentation, but I, this is actually a practical webinar from our side where we can collect your feedback and, uh, and work on a roadmap moving forward. So thank you very much, and Faust and colleagues, over to you. Thank you very much, Francesco. Um, so I would like to start by um, uh, saying thank you to everyone. Uh, thank you for the GPC and AORs for this opportunity. Uh, we share the same uh, goals as Francesco was, was saying. We think that this is a great opportunity to uh, enhance the collaboration both at global level, but also at, at field level. Uh, I would also like to thank you all of you who are present today uh, from the protection cluster and AORs. Uh, thank you very much for, for your time. Um, so in the last year, both uh, organizations, uh, the GPC together with the AORs and uh, IMPACT start working together. Uh, and we expect this session will contribute to enhance this collaboration both uh, at both level. Uh, I will share now the presentation. Just one um, request for Francesco. Uh, I won't be able to see if someone is uh, has uh, their hands up uh, during the presentation, so please interrupt me if there is any question. Uh, everyone, feel free to to give feedback. As Francesco said, uh, we expect uh, to have a, a very open uh, discussion. Um, can everyone see my screen? Great. OK. OK. So what are the objectives of uh, this session for us? The first one is to present and refresh uh, for those of you who already know uh, reach or impact, how we work. Uh, and then, and more importantly, I will say objectives two and three to identify how we can work together throughout the HPC. In particular, how can we contribute to the PAU, GPU, HNO, uh, or PIN estimations, and protection risk severity assessment. And also, uh, um, very importantly, to get your feedback on how the data we produce uh, can better inform cluster decision making. And this is uh, the content of, of this session. 
Uh, we are going to start with a short introduction and background on impact and, and reach. Uh, then we are going to uh, present a little bit more uh, the work stream on protection at impact, uh, where we have been working in the last year. And then there are going to be two specific zoom-ins in two of our most imp important research cycles. Uh, importance in, in terms of uh, geographical scope. They are present in, in most of our countries where we have presence, but also important in terms of the type of data that could be potentially useful uh, for uh, for your work. So we are going to ha first have the a short introduction to the Humanitarian Situation Monitoring, or HSM, and they are Soledad uh, will be, be presenting um, this part. And then uh, Mario will present uh, the probably most well-known or the, the, the assessment that you might be familiar with, that is the multi-sector need assessment or MSNA. We will have a final uh, protection zoom in in the MSNA. And finally, uh, we would like to dedicate at least 20 minutes to have uh, feedback and Q&A se um, session. Uh, however, um, please interrupt if, if you would like to make a comment or make a question uh, throughout the presentation. So background on impact and reach. Um, so impact in a nutshell, uh, first of all, I would like to make a clarification. Um, we are usually, I think, known by the name reach. However, the name of the organization is actually impact initiatives. Um, Impact Initiative is a Chiniba-based NGO and is the largest independent data provider in context of humanitarian crisis. Uh, we are present in around 30 uh, countries right now, um, with more than 300 international experts working working across uh, the 30 countries. Uh, and these figures that you can can be see uh, can see here are uh, figures from last year uh, to have a sense or magnitude of uh, the work we are undertaking. And uh, impact uh, takes uh, an initiative-based approach to structure our programming. So as you can see here, we have three uh, initiatives, and one of them, the most um, probably well-known, is REACH, uh, which is the one that worked with MSNA, HSM, and, and the other uh, assessments that we are going to cover uh, throughout this presentation. However, uh, we also have Agora. Um, Agora promotes localized and multisectoral aid action in support of the recovery and stabilization of crisis affected communities. And Panda aims at promote, promoting, uh, the, um, sorry, improving the impact of humanitarian uh, development uh, interventions throughout program design, assessment, and monitoring and evaluation. How we work, um, we have two uh, main work streams. On the one hand, uh, we do data collection. Uh, as you may know, uh, we collect data through throughout either interagency assessments. Uh, we also do remote sensing. Uh, in the case of protection, uh, I think we uh, at, at least uh, as far as I'm, uh, I'm aware, we, we don't have the methodology yet to use this technology uh, for the analysis of protection risk, but this is an activity that we uh, do as well, and we do deco secondary data review. Now, apart from data collection, we also do analysis and dissemination of reports, maps, and online uh, dashboards. What is our goal, uh, we have three main goals. On the one hand, uh, making sure that evidence is available uh, to take informed decision, but making evidence available is uh, usually not enough. Uh, when we say evidence, we are talking about indicators, we are talking about dots. Uh, but for taking decision, it's also important that those dots are connected. Uh, so that's where the analysis uh, is important, is 
um, to connect all those pieces of information to make sense and try to take an informed decision. So on top of uh, making sure the evidence is available, um, we also have as a goal uh, that analysis is conducted and that this analysis is being used by um, uh, humanitarian partners, uh, in this case, protection clusters or AORs. Um, so when we say that uh, evidence is available, we talk about both uh, multi-sectoral and sector-specific assessment. Uh, here you will see a couple of uh, examples of uh, sectoral specific assessment. Again, I think you might uh, be more familiar with the MSNA or multi-sectoral type of assessment, but we also um, work with different partners to have a more specific uh, sector type of assessment. And if you are interested to uh, to better know what what type of data, what type of assessment we have conducted in the past, uh, you have here a link to the resource center. So I invite you to take a look and see what kind of information either on protection or from other sectors is available in your specific uh, countries or uh, crisis. Um, for us, it's also important as, uh, as I was saying that evidence is uh, analyzed. It's not only about producing indicators and publish them, but also trying to make sense of this data. Uh, and here are a few examples of support analysis process that we have undertaken uh, in the past, uh, in the case of sectoral assessment. Uh, for example, MSNA data is being used uh, to inform the IPC. Of course, MSNA data is not uh, sufficient uh, to assess the severity of uh, food security. So uh, this is being triangulated and complemented with other data sources. So this is typically what we are talking about when we say analysis. And here are other two examples uh, of the worst severity classification and the shelter in their index score. Uh, typically, the, the way they work is, is, is the same. Uh, we take uh, 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 raw data or actually clean data, but indicators, and then they are contrasted with other data sources, and then we'll reach an agreement of what is uh, the situation in regards with uh, specific sectoral needs. How we work? Um, our mandate is to work with, the, with and through existing coordinator bodies and other key actors in humanitarian response to ensure that uh, our data is aligned as closely as possible with the need of um, the humanitarian community. And here you have an example of the different parties uh, or actors in the humanitarian sector with whom we have been working uh, in the past. Uh, this is clusters, uh, UN agencies, and donors. Now, uh, who do we inform? Uh, which tries to inform humanitarian response at three different levels, the strategic level, the programmatic level, and the operational one. Uh, here in the first, you have an example of uh, informing strategic decision makers. Uh, this, per, this picture rep um, reflects the first MSNA conducted in Haiti in 2022. Uh, that helped to draw the first, for the first time, an overview of both uh, severities and local on location of populations need across the countries. Um, and the point here is to enable prioritization across the entire uh, country. Um, we also inform programmatic decision makers. So in this example here, we have a localized rapid assessment uh, that was triggered to shape a very specific local response, not national wide like usually is the MSNA, um, to identify what the exact needs are in a limited area. Um, so this is a different kind of um, assessment, different kind of information, and aim at uh, inform uh, a different uh, type of decision makers. And finally, uh, here we have in the third example, uh, operational decision makers. 
Um, in this case, we have the example of CCCM as uh, an example of how we inform more operational decision making, such as uh, where to build new infrastructure or where to fix the train and hygiene facilities. So now, after this uh, very brief uh, presentation and refresh of uh, who we are and what uh, we do, I would like to introduce the protection work stream at Impact. Um, first, I would like to mention that even though in the last uh, couple of years, uh, we haven't had a focal point at global level uh, in protection, uh, this work, work stream has been central uh, to Impact's work. On the one hand, um, we had protection sectoral models in all the multi-sectoral uh, servers globally that we have undertaken in the past. Uh, this encompass uh, MSNAs, HSM or humanitarian situation monitoring and area-based assessment, and also sectoral assessment in multiple countries on a more demand basis. Uh, this is, uh, we have conducted, for example, child protection assessment, GBB assessment, or protection monitoring. However, um, it's important to recognize that in comparison with other sectors, we have had uh, historically less proximity, both with the uh, global protection cluster and the AOR, and less internal expertise. Uh, but the message that we want to convey is that we are uh, working now together at global level to strengthen this collaboration, uh, both to gain more internal expertise at, at bridge. We are aware of our uh, technical limitations, uh, but also to, to enhance these uh, collaborations uh, at country level. So um, about this um, protection um, uh, data that we produce, as I was mentioning. Uh, on the one hand, we have protection models in multi-sector assessment. Uh, this type of data uh, um, is different from the type of data that we usually collect in protection focus assessment. And here is an overview, a general overview of what is the aim. Uh, uh, Thank you for muting. Um, so here is, um, uh, in a nutshell, what is the aim of uh, the type of data that is collected through these two type of assessment. So when it comes at uh, protection models in multi-sector assessments like MSNA, uh, usually this type of information allows for less deep sectoral data we usually collect a couple of indicators, not all the data that we would like, but at a larger scale. And it's usually, this data is statistically significant, not always, but usually at a lower level. So usually we have very good data uh, at admin two level, but for a reduced number of indicators. Uh, and this type of data usually might be useful for PIN and GF estimates. Uh, geographical prioritization, for example, uh, the map that I show um, a couple of slides ago uh, from IT, as well as intersectoral analysis, um, given that uh, we are assessing at the same time protection uh, and other sectoral needs. Now, when it comes to protection focus assessment, and here we might be talking about overall protection or focus on uh, GBB, child protection, HLP, as well as um, mine action. In this case, I didn't mention mine, mine action here uh, pretty much because uh, as far as I know, uh, we haven't conducted uh, any mine action uh, focus assessment uh, at impact. Uh, so that's the reason why, but we have uh, in the case of GBB, child protection, and HLP. Uh, and this type of information uh, allows a deeper understanding of sector specific issues and most importantly, their drivers. We are able to use uh, much more indicators 
um, usually this type of assessment is not only quantitative, but also is complemented with a qualitative component. So this allows a better understanding of the drivers. And this type of assessment might be useful for designing and implementing, uh, implementing specialized intervention uh, for the PAU and for the protection risk severity assessment. And depending on the scale, uh, they might be useful for PIN and the GF. On this case, it really depends on how um, statistically significant is, is the data, the coverage, and the, and the sample. Um, so now I would like to, to go a little bit more in deep uh, on, on the two, on the protection focus assessment and the protection models on multi-sectoral assessment. Um, here you will have, uh, you will see an, a selected uh, list of examples of assessment with the focus on protection that took place in the past in different countries. So you can have an idea of uh, what we could do uh, if there is an, a demand in country, um, depending again on what is the information uh, gap or information need. So for example, we have conducted an assessment on children on the move and, and campaign and separated children in Italy and Greece. Also an assessment on fragmenting family and protection assessment on conflicted, uh, conflict affected population in Afghanistan. Uh, in Libya, for example, we have conducted the gender-based violence uh, service assessment. Uh, in this case, those that are uh, not in color is because uh, those um, uh, reports are not published. Um, usually for uh, sensitivity issues or, or for any agreement with with our counterpart. Um, but again, uh, I would like to share with you the link to the resource center so you can um, uh, explore uh, yourself. Uh, and if you like to, you know, have access to any of the uh, research cycles that are mentioned here and are not published, uh, please feel free to reach out to, to me and I can facilitate uh, the information whenever it is, is possible. Now, when it comes to protection in multi-sectoral assessment. Also? Yes, sorry. Sorry, before you move on, there was a question in the chat. Uh, protection indicators of the protection model for multi-sectoral assessment are protection indicators or protection mainstreaming indicators? Good questions. Uh, I will say both. Uh, in general, that's exactly what I'm, I was going to refer to in this slide. So on the one hand, we have a specific protection indicators. Uh, usually when you, for example, I guess I, I will use the MSNA example because I think most of you might be familiar with it. But usually when we uh, share the questionnaire, you will find uh, that there is a column uh, in the DIP. For those of you um, who doesn't know, the DRP is a data analysis plan. But it's pre pretty much um, the questionnaire. We have a column with uh, the sectors, right? Uh, so there we have a first classification, and our, those ones are uh, protection-specific question. But as you will see now in these examples, uh, there are also some uh, protection elements or aspects uh, that are mainstream across sectors. Uh, so when we say protection in multi-sector assessment, uh, we, we could have both protection specific, but also uh, protection mainstream aspect in other sector question. Um, was, was that clear? No, Salome. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, so as I was uh, saying, uh, multi-sector assessment provide also information on household and community capacities and vulnerability from other sectors. So uh, in this case, uh, beyond whether we are actually assessing, for example, whether uh, a protection threat uh, or a protection risk is, for example, interfering with uh, accessing services, uh, from other sectors like education. Uh, on top of that, we can also collect other data that is related to 
capacities and vulnerabilities uh, from the household or from the communities. Um, and this data can be classified into the path categories to feed into protection analysis. And here we have uh, a few examples. Uh, for example, um, from WASH, um, all these questions that I'm, I'm going to show you here uh, comes from the indicator bank, so the MSNA indicator bank. Um, so from WASH, uh, you might have a question that is, does your household have a problem related to access to water? And as you can see here in bold, uh, there are some questions, some, sorry, options uh, that are related to uh, protection concerns. Um, in the case of shelter, for example, uh, we have this question in the, in the indicator bank. Uh, what noticeable issue does the drilling where your household currently live have? Uh, and here you can see that there are two options, uh, at least, that uh, might give you information about the capacities or vulnerability, actually, that this household may have. Uh, so, for instance, some household might say, uh, my, my report that they are unable to lock their shelter or that they lack uh, of uh, light lightning outside the shelter. Similar from education, you can uh, gather information on uh, capacities or vulnerabilities of uh, the ho household when it comes to child protection issues. Uh, for example, um, uh, we can uh, include in an MSNA this question um, on whether the school year has been interrupted um, in the last year due to one of the following event. And as you can see here, some of these events are related to protection threats or protection risk, sorry. And also we have some questions on the livelihood model uh, that also give you information on vulnerabilities and capacities. Uh, from the household, in this case, we are asking how many female or male uh, member of the household, if any, has lost their job uh, or major source of income in the last 12 months. On top of that, uh, protection in multi-sector assessment um, can provide you information on what is the impact of protect that protection risk have to accessing other um service uh, sector services um and contribute to estimate people in in need of protection assistance uh, so here we have some example uh on the left hand side you will see uh, the three pillars of the protection need that the gpc is um has uh, recently uh, introduced uh, so here you will see some questions uh, example questions from the MSNA that can give you uh, some insights for these uh, three pillars. One example is this question uh, where we ask uh, to the head of household if their children uh, did not receive a vaccination, what were the main reasons? As, as you can see here, we can identify whether it was related to insecurity either at the health facility or while traveling to the health facility. Um, similarly, um, we could uh, introduce a question asking whether the household find it difficult to visit marketplace, uh, whether there was any physical barrier. Uh, and in this case as well, uh, you will find uh, among the options, uh, some of them that are related to uh, or might be related to protection risks. And a last example, um, here I'm not fully sure, uh, to be honest, how to categorize this within the three um, uh, protection uh, need pillars, uh, but I think it might fit probably uh, below some of them or one of them. Uh, explain why your households um, uh, can sleep, uh, the issue they face for sleeping, and one of them is also related to an, uh, an unsafe environment. Um, here I would like to expand a little bit what I was uh, referring in the, in the previous slide to give a more visual example of how uh, this uh, question that some of them come from uh, different sectors other than uh, the protection 
questions, how they could potentially feed into the three uh, pillars of protection need. So on one hand, we have access to services, then we have participation in activity, and then safety. Um, this example uh, is using MSNA indicators from 2024. Uh, and as you can see, we are using, uh, we are proposing uh, how can uh, indicators or question from health, education, shelter, ETC, or protection uh, could inform um, the, the estimation of, of people in need. We are not saying uh, that this should be the way you should proceed, but this is a, an example uh, of how could potentially be used. And a final point um, about uh, protection, the protection work stream at impact or reach is how can we better work together? As um, I mentioned before, um, uh, we, we start to have a focal point on protection. This is someone responsible of overseeing what we are doing in terms of protection, someone listening with uh, the protection cluster, uh, with the AORs at global level, uh, and also uh, improving someone overseeing the, the quality of our assessment since uh, last year. So our work is very recent and uh, we are trying to, to enhance this, this work scene. And for us, um, having a partnership with the protection cluster and the EORs is fundamental uh, both for, for us to, to enhance our expertise, but also to make sure that what we produce it's going to have impact and it's going to be used uh, by all of you. Uh, so something uh, that I think Francesco mentioned at the beginning, and please, Francesco, feel free to jump in to complement if, if needed. Uh, this year, we start to work uh, together with the GPC, the EORs, and DTM at global level to map data and information that uh, are relevant for protection analysis and classifying them against the 15 protection risk, uh, the path pillars and sub pillars, and the protection needs category. And we hope this work uh, will allow us to, um, to agree on which indicators are we going to include in different type of assessment, uh, not only MSNA or household surveys, but also any type of assessment, like informal interviews, focus group discussion, and so on. It's a very titanic uh, work, I will say, uh, because there is a lot of, there are a lot of indicators out there, uh, but this is a first uh, necessary step toward uh, having a more coordinated approach. And lastly, something that uh, I would like to, to mention is what opportunities uh, we think we have to work together between the protection clusters, the AORs, and REACH or IMPACT. Um, so here uh, you might be familiar with this um, diagram on that uh, landscape. Um, and I think there are, we think there are three points where we can uh, have more uh, partnership. The first one is uh, when asking yourself if uh, are critical questions being collected. I think here uh, we can engage to look at what we are collecting, where, when, and how. Also, um, when it comes to what method is best suited for the information need that you have, uh, in this case, uh, you can engage with our teams to uh, maybe define specific approaches beyond MSNA. As I mentioned before, MSNA is just one tool, uh, but one tool cannot answer all the questions. One tool cannot fill it, um, all the gaps or cannot fill all the gaps. Uh, so that's something that we should bear in mind. Uh, and as I mentioned, we also have 
other assessment or other type of methodologies are being used. Um, so I think here we there is an opportunity. And finally, at this point, um, when when it comes to including uh, questions or indicators in, in assessments, um, I think there is room for more engagement or for uh, MSNA, MSNA, sorry, non-core indicators and other type of assessments. Um, this um, MSNA non-core indicator, this is something that is going to be covered in the presentation uh, on MSNA that is going to be conducted by uh, Mario. But in a nutshell, uh, MSNA non-core indicator are those uh, that are not being requested from HQ to our field teams as mandatory indicators. Uh, and this refer to those indicators where there is flexibility to agree on, on okay, how we contextualize uh, the information needs are, and the indicators, and there is more room to include a specific uh, context specific indicators. Um, I will stop here. Um, probably before uh, handing over to Soledad, who will be presenting uh, the HSM. Uh, she will present how this um, um, research cycle works and how uh, this could uh, be useful for protection clusters and AOR work. Uh, I would like to know if there is any questions so far. Uh, Fausto, there is a hand raised. Yes. And then there is a question in the chat. Uh, Baja, if I pronounce it well. I don't know if it's a hand raise, so it was a mistake, colleague. Okay, while we wait for the colleagues to connect, there was a question from Aida. Uh, is there any specific reason why Rich has never done an assessment on mine action? On, sorry? Mine action. Ah, yes. Uh, honestly, I don't have a specific answer. I think it might be linked to two uh, reasons. The first one is that um, the specific uh, as sectoral assessments are usually on demand base. This is in country where there is a partner, um, ex for example, a UN agency, a cluster, uh, a donor with a specific uh, interest, uh, then we conduct that assessment based on their interest. Uh, so one reason might be that we have never received that type of demand, as far as I know. Um, however, um, we are right now conducting a mine action uh, assessment. Uh, it's not a specific on mine action, it's mine action plus um, other protection concerns. So it's not, uh, the scope is not limited to, to mine action, uh, but we are giving the first step toward, toward that. Uh, the second reason is like is that I think um, we might not have felt that we had the expertise to do that uh, beyond again probably a specific very specific question in MSNAs or in key informant interviews. Um, so that's that's a reason. But if there is any interest uh, for conducting a, a mine action assessment, uh, then it would be a matter of identifying what are the specific information needs that you have. And if we have the methodology to actually answer those information needs, uh, then uh, that's absolutely a possibility. Uh, I'm not closing the door to, to that, uh, but I wanted to be honest in the sense that uh, in comparison with the other AOR, we have uh, almost uh, nothing. I, I think, again, there is just one uh, assessment that we are conducting right now in Mali, but that's, that's it so far. And I think there was another question, Francesco? Uh, no, the colleague that raised the hand, uh, just put it down. Um, there is a colleague, Ocot, you want to come in? I haven't noted the assessment element covering my PSS. Please come in. Much better that you, you come in. Uh, 
Hi. Patrick. Thank you for the presentation. Well, uh, that's the question actually I'm just trying to raise concern for. Over to you. OK, I can read it then. So um, I have noted the assessment element covering MHPSS and the protection. Is there any information on this as to why it's not included? Sorry, we type of. Um, we type of information, sorry, could you repeat? Patrick, can you come in and just formulate better your question? I'm not sure I understand it. Thank you. Well, thank you so much um, for the presentation, first of all. I am very glad to be on this podium. Uh, my question is from the presentation where, where I'm trying to look at uh, if MHPSS could be also incorporated in the rich assessment part of it as, uh, as contributing to the MSNA. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, that's a very good question. Uh, we have uh, done this in the past, uh, mostly through MSNA. Uh, on this regard, um, this is something which, so this area, this topic is something where we share uh, the competency within impact. Uh, so this is an internal uh, distribution. On this topic, on the one hand, we have the public health unit that actually design um, using uh, public health standards. Uh, so they follow uh, international guidelines on how to measure uh, mental health and psychological distress uh, needs. Uh, so they are the ones that propose how this should be measured. There are some MSNA that include this question. Um, so the short answer, yes. Uh, on top of that, so when it comes to uh, multi-sector assessment, and on top of that, uh, we also have conducted um, a specific assessment with a focus on mental health and psychological distress for um, typically adolescents or uh, veterans of um, the war in, in Ukraine. Uh, so we can also share some examples if you are interested on what has been done, so you have an idea of uh, what could be done also being replicated in, in your context. Um, I will pass over to uh, Soledad, and she will be uh, presenting the, the HSM. And at the end of the presentation, I will uh, come back uh, to close and, and have a, a feedback session. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK, so I'm I'm uh, Soledad. I work in Impact HQ uh, as real-time officer, and I'm the global focal point for HSM. So HSM is one of these uh, rich assessments that is not MSNA. So it's maybe not you're not very familiar with it in some context, so I'll just uh, do a brief presentation on this. So by HSM, we understand humanitarian situation monitoring assessments, and they are multi-sectoral rich assessments that are characterized by uh, the recurring primary data collection and analysis, aiming to identify and monitoring humanitarian needs in crisis-affected areas where because of access or lack of resources, it is not possible to conduct regular um, household level assessments. And the situation evolves um, rapidly enough for us to need to track what is happening in between these big annual uh, assessments like the MSNA or the IPC. So the main objective of the HSM is to inform emergency response planning and prioritization in context that, as I said, evolve uh, quite quickly. Um, so although HSM, as a note, HSM is not defined by a single methodology, and we do have some countries that run household level HS HSMs, but in general, uh, because HSM requires um, loss of data collection cycles in one single year, uh, we usually uh, rely on the area of knowledge methodology, which I will present in a few minutes, to collect and analyze uh, primary data. Um, 
So as I mentioned, the HSM main objective uh, is to provide updated information at a higher frequency than annual planning assessments uh, in order to inform emergency response planning. Uh, as many other risk assessments, and as Fausto mentioned, the HSM can inform different levels of decision making. And for example, the most uh, use of useful ones are a strategic um, at the strategic and at the programmatic level. For example, at the strategic level, uh, HSM has been quite useful to support advocacy efforts in areas where there is limited data because mainly because of access constraints and for example at the more programmatic level uh, the HSM is very useful to flag when and where things are changing and which areas might require uh, further action or uh, further assessments. Um, so as I mentioned HSM uses different methodologies but the area of knowledge is for many, many HSM cycles globally, the main data source. Uh, so what it is, um, basically is a methodology. So it's a method of collecting and analyzing data uh, to produce, and very important, indicative information on humanitarian conditions. Uh, it is a community level, um, community level methodology based on key informant interviews. And the goal or the purpose um, of this methodology is to enable the collection of data uh, on areas without necessarily having access to these areas. And I will explain a bit in a few minutes why this is possible. Uh, although we have some teams that use it also in accessible areas because um, the resources require uh, to run such an assessment, it, they are lower than, for example, for an MSNA. So uh, AOK is less resource intensive. So how does it work exactly? Uh, what we do uh, is that we first select which communities we are interested in, um, which areas of concern we want to assess. And then uh, we interview key informants, which uh, declare that they have um, knowledge about the situation in in these communities um, because we can have more than one key I per community the first step in the analysis process is to first aggregate these uh, individual key informant interviews uh, at the community level and then we can continue aggregating at um, the level of analysis that we are interested in so this will depend on the information needs of the context and we have some cases where teams aggregate at district level others provincial level etc as a note and this is very important to understand how to use aok data is that aok is never a statistically representative just because uh, we need to select key, key eyes purposefully based on whether they can answer our questions on the community of interest. And also another limitation of uh, AOK is that because it's a KI-based uh, methodology, uh, the results depend on KI reliability. So as such, uh, what we know and have noticed is that AOK is better placed to collect data on phenomena that is visible and known by most members of the community or uh, to be able to flag very acute uh, needs and very extreme situations. On the other hand, it's not very well placed to collect information on phenomena that is very household specific as, for example, uh, food consumption behaviors, because it's very unlikely that the key eye, unless it uh, has a specific thematic knowledge, uh, will be able to answer how households are behaving in their private life. Um, depending on access, uh, we have two types of AOK. We have uh, direct AOK and indirect AOK. Uh, the main difference in direct AOK, as you can see in the graph, uh, key eyes and the data collection teams, they are in the community that we are interested in and the key eye uh, reports at the community level. 
However, the key comparative advantage of AOK is that it can be adapted and it can be used to collect data even when physical access is uh, not possible. And we call this uh, type of AOK indirect AOK and how does it work? So in this case, um, the key informants and the data collection team, they are not uh, physically say, present. I think maybe you need to mute yourself. Okay. Was saying uh, both the data collection teams and the key informant, they are not in the in the community of interest. And what data collection teams do is that they go to what we call convergence points, which are places near the hard to reach area. And they position themselves there. Usually at these convergence points are like markets, uh, border crossings, uh, like cities, uh, surrounding this area, and there they interview key eyes who declare that have recent knowledge about the community that we are trying to assess. And what this means usually is either people that have displaced recently and they have been in the community in the last 30 days before data collection is happening, or they go often to this uh, community either because of work. So for example, traders, some humanitarian workers, um, or they are in contact, direct contact with someone still living in this area. Uh, as you might imagine, this is not an ideal uh, methodology, but it allows us to get a snapshot of severity in areas where literally uh, other type of data collection is impossible and we have no um, no data, no information at all about what is happening. Um, so I will just do a brief zooming. Uh, well, as I have mentioned, HSM is a multi-sectoral assessment. However, we do have teams, well, in every HSM, there is a module on protection, and uh, we do produce uh, protection-specific uh, products uh, based on HSM data. And what the added value of HSM is for um, collecting data on protection is that when we use AOK, we are able to provide data on hard to reach areas where usually protection issues are of high concern and there is a big overlap. Um, as a community level methodology, AOK um, allows us to capture some community dynamics and allows us to include some indicator and questions that are sometimes not possible to include in household level surveys. Um, as a KI methodology, we can also, because we are not interviewing the households directly and the KI is reporting about the whole community and not about his or her own experience, we can include uh, some protection indicators that are often considered too sensible for a household interview. However, as I mentioned before, um, AOK is KI based, uh, so KIs are going to be able to flag and to report on issues that are very visible in the community. So as an example, for example, child marriage, AOK and the HSM, if it's especially if it's indirect AOK, is not going to be able to flag which households are engaging in this uh, behavior. Uh, but however, if child marriage is very extended in the community, AOK will be very likely able to capture these and it will um, allow us to do some advocacy to uh, conduct further assessments and better understand what is the situation. Uh, and yeah, as a multi-sectoral assessment, as Fausto explained before, HSM allows us to understand the relationship between protection and other multi-sectoral vulnerabilities. And basically, I think the main point that I want to make is that HSM is not a household level survey and as such has lots of limitations. However, it is able to flag and highlight, monitor, um, when and where the situation is getting very bad uh, for then be able to uh, 
proceed and further action will hopefully follow. Um, so I'll just uh, talk a bit about um, Somalia, the HSM in Somalia. The HSM in Somalia is focused only on hard to reach areas uh, where household surveys are not feasible. Um, the REACH team in Somalia closely collaborated uh, with the Somalia Protection Cluster to make sure in 2023 to make sure that all the hard to reach districts categorized as a severity score of four and five by the cluster were included in the HSM sampling. And why? Because this data uh, was then used to inform the programmatic planning of the cluster for the districts that were just opening um, as a result of the Somali government uh, efforts to push against non-state actors. Um, and the HSM was the only data source for the majority of districts. And um, yeah, it was the only data source in this case. And I will, I think we will move now to the MSNA. So I will pass it back to Fausto, but if you have any questions, I can answer at the end, I will say. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Soledad. And yes, for the sake of, of time, maybe uh, we can gather some questions if you have on HSM uh, and we can answer at the end. Um, I will pass over to uh, Mario, who will be presenting uh, on MSNA. Thank you, Fausto. Um, so I'm Mario Fidalg from the Humanitarian Planning and Prioritization Unit at Impact HQ. Um, internally also known as the MSNA unit. Thank you all for attending this session um, and looking forward to presenting the MSNA approach and the associated uh, analytical framework. <clears throat> I would um, urge you to save your questions for the end for the sake of time and also because Fausto will be doing a more deep dive into protection uh, linkages and potential collaborations in the next part of the presentation. So I'd like to start off by placing the MSNAs into the broader uh, humanitarian information system. Here we see components, timing, and analytical outputs of the system, two of which REACH um, contributes to on two fronts. The first being regular assessments through the MSNA, and the second being uh, through real-time monitoring through HSM, which Soledad just uh, presented. Uh, both of these methodologies have different frequencies, so MSNAs are more in-depth uh, assessments with a much lower frequency, usually annual or semi-annual. And of course, HSM, as we've seen, is a much more um, frequent assessment, also, also multi-sectoral, but measuring rapid changes um, and so useful for, for more of those uh, types of situations. Next slide. So what is the MSNA approach? Um, the main goal is to improve evidence-based decision-making and planning and prioritization uh, at many levels, country, regional, and more recently, global level within the humanitarian system by providing uh, a framework and tools to capture the magnitude and severity of needs in crisis-affected households. This is in line with um, Grand bargain commitment number five to improve joint and impartial needs assessments. Uh, the three bullet points below you can see the MSNA is often a nationwide assessment and aims to be representative of each population group falling within the scope of the assessment. It's a household level methodology, so it is very granular and often statistically representative at admin two, admin one, and even admin two levels, as, as Fausto has. Uh, recently outlined. Um, and Fausto, in, his, in one of his slides coming up following, uh, he will be looking at the advantages and disadvantages of this type of methodology with regard specifically to protection. Importantly, it's conducted in close coordination. Sorry, can you go back, Fausto? <laughs> Importantly, it's uh, conducted in close collaboration with the ICCG and assessment and analysis working groups at country level 
And regarding representativeness, um, it aims to be representative for all population groups and administrative units at a level that's previously discussed with the humanitarian coordination. And on the right, we have a map here that uh, also had a similar one, but this one is specifically for MSNAs. In 2023, we implemented 20 MSNAs in 17 countries um, with 175,000 household interviews speaking on behalf of 680,000 uh, crisis affected individuals, just so you get a sense of the, the magnitude that we've reached last year. Next slide. So at a systems level, um, how can MSNA data be used and how is it used? Uh, first of all, it feeds into sector frameworks and can feed into sector frameworks, uh, namely the, the protection analytical framework, uh, which then with other, of course, secondary data sources, very important to acknowledge, uh, feeds into specific sectoral outputs as well as the GIF and feeding into to humanitarian needs overviews at country level. Um, in parallel, REACH maintains its own independent analytical framework, the Multi-Sector Needs Index, which is composed of sectoral composites that we develop internally, um, and then feeding into this overall measure of need, which is the MSNI. And the main output is the MSNA Bulletin, uh, which is the main output produced by country teams. But as we'll see later, there are also other outputs <clears throat> um, you know, sectoral and thematic briefs that can come out of uh, the same data source. Next slide. So this is the analytical framework that we've developed in house, and it's very much still a work in progress. But I'll just run you through through the uh, logical process here. In step one, we have the sectoral indicators. As uh, Fausto mentioned, these come from an indicator bank that's developed in close coordination with our global focal points. These can be analyzed individually and feed into sectoral outputs, but also feed into what we call sectoral composites for each sector and also livelihoods. Um, we assign a severity level similar to GIAF. And these frameworks are developed uh, in close collaboration again with these sectoral focal points and uh, mostly follow humanitarian coordination and global clusters guidelines. And then at the last step, we have the multi sector needs index, which sounds intimidating, but it's not. It's really just the maximum value obtained from the sectoral composites. So in this case, <clears throat> and this is, of course, at the household level. So WASH, Severity 4, Shelter 2, Education 2, and Food 3. That would result in this household having an MSNI um, value of Severity 4. And this scale goes from 1 to 4 plus. So it's a 5-point ordinal scale, 4 plus being the maximum in acknowledgement that we won't capture the maximum level uh, of needs with our framework. Um, the MSNI in itself has limitations and can only speak to need severity. So we unpack this metric with the four metrics at the bottom right uh, of the of the slide: households in need. So those are actually. Can you move to the to the next slide? <clears throat> so we have the first two metrics that we saw before. Uh, representing the intensity of a crisis solely relying on the MSNI value. That is um, households in need, so households with values 3, 4, and 4 plus, and then households with acute needs <clears throat> represented by values of 4 and 4 plus. And then to further unpack the metric uh, and speak more towards the complexity or breadth of the crisis, we use the, the sectoral composite scores again, feeding back into the MSNI, and we calculate the number of sectors with needs and the needs profile um, per household. So in this case, we see that wash, protection, and food are in need, values of three and above, um, and the number of sectors with needs then is three, and then the needs profile, of course, is wash, protection, and food. And at the crisis level, we would compute the average number of sectors with needs Oops, thanks. 
<clears throat> at the crisis level, we'd compute the average number of sectors of needs and the most common needs profile, which can also be disaggregated by population group and administrative unit uh, as needed. Noting that data disaggregation is a key component of this process as well. Next slide. Um, in recent years, REACH has had momentum in standardization and quality control by HQ, but we acknowledge there needs to be a balance between in-country planning and uh, cross-crisis comparability. Since 2021, we've been running a cross-crisis initiative leveraging MSNA data to compare um, indicators across crises. And you can see on the right there, a shelter output for, for the same. Uh, Fausto briefly mentioned the indicator bank and core indicators. The indicator bank is something that we draft yearly and revamp yearly along with the sectoral focal points um, and includes three, three levels of indicators, tier ones, two, and three. Tier one are the core indicators that have to be uh, applied university, universally across all MSNAs. Tier two are highly recommended and tier three are optional. And we implemented this year a modular approach, kind of an all or nothing. So you have to choose groups of indicators uh, to ensure um, cohesion in the analysis and make sure we're not missing key information uh, at the end. <clears throat> Um, even for tier one indicators, though, we allow for flexibility, but we need to be able to classify them into global categories for comparison. So, for example, here um, in terms of child protection concerns of separated children, we have categories severe and very severe, and these can be contextualized in country, but should be classified into these broader categories to be able to calculate the protection composite um, framework. And then also for adequacy of shelter types, it's the same thing. Uh, of course, this is a highly contextual phenomenon, but country teams should be able to classify the shelter types into adequate, inadequate, and no shelter. And in the right, you can see in the top left uh, visualization of the fact sheet, we've compared the shelter types across uh, the many contexts in cross crisis 2022 <clears throat> across crises. Uh, next slide, please. So just to show you the range of outputs, could you go back one just so we can see the first? Uh, thanks. Um, this comes from a high level strategic output, uh, more for uh, prioritization in country from Myanmar. We see the first two metrics being seen here, the amount of households in need and in acute needs for four different population groups, and also in the bottom right, uh, disaggregated by region of Myanmar, so admin, admin one level. Then we have uh, next, yeah. Then we have two briefs, uh, one in Somalia related to accountability to affected populations, leveraging MSNA findings, and the one on the right conducted in Afghanistan related to access to markets, humanitarian assistance, and exposure to shocks. Then we have, of course, the JIAF. So in many countries, the MSNA is a principal data source used in, in the JIAF and in people in need estimations, uh, which is a key use of MSNA data in parallel. And finally, I'll finish here with this, uh, what we call convergence of metrics, the four metrics that I presented previously to unpack the MSNI. Um, on the y-axis, we have the average number of sectors in need, <clears throat> and on the x-axis, we have the average um, MSNI score. And we can see a pretty, pretty intimate correlation between the two metrics uh, in the chart. We also have the size of the, the red symbols, the percentage of households experiencing uh, acute needs. So those would be households experiencing levels 4 and 4+. Four plus. Um, just to say that this is a one way at the global level through the cross crisis, we've been leveraging the data, uh, still very much a work in progress, but we do have increased um, interest by global donors and other actors in, in this exercise. And um, that's it.
Looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you very much, Mario. Sorry, I'm having an issue with the slides. Um, thank you very much. Um, so I will finish uh, now talking about uh, protection in MSNA in 2024. Um, I will go quite quickly through this, but mostly because I would like to 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 left to to leave some time at the end. Uh, for feedback on your end and have a, a Q and A session. Uh, but if you would like to uh, go more in deep on any of the points that I will talk, uh, please let me know. Um, so Mario was presenting uh, the MSNI, and the main reason why um, we wanted to present that to to you is to um, uh, to to uh, take into account the the, the magnitude of the importance that uh, the MSNI has uh, for us and why we are requesting uh, some, uh, not some, we are requesting country team to include some indicators uh, mandatory in every uh, country. Um, so uh, I think, again, for the sake of time, I will um, skip uh, this. The only point I, I want to make here is that uh, given that uh, the MSNA has a strategic um, role in decision making, uh, it's important for us to have a, a metric of, of needs um, and to serve this purpose, we need to standardize need metrics to be able to be uh, comparable across situations. Uh, not only between countries, but mostly within countries. So to allow this kind of um, graph where we have uh, where needs could be more more acute within within the country. Um, so I'm here listing some advantages and disadvantages that MSNA have when it comes to protection, and I'm sure you will have a lot of more uh, constraints or limitations uh, based on on your experience. Um, I will skip the advantage because I think we already talked about them. But of course, there are uh, very clear and important limitations that we should keep in mind when, um, uh, first of all, um, assessing which question should be included in the MSNA, and second, how to interpret the data that comes from MSNA. Um, the first of all, as you may know uh, for sure, is that the prevalence of penny protection risk cannot be inquired in household surveys because of uh, sensitivity issues. Uh, the second one is the time constraint that usually is related to this uh, multi-sectoral nature. Uh, usually uh, we have uh, more than 10 sectors, uh, including questions uh, or feeding to MSNAs. And uh, we cannot, unfortunately, have all the questions that we would like uh, in the household survey about protection. So uh, some sort of prioritization should be should be done in terms of uh, what question should should be asked. Uh, and third point, and I think this is probably um, the most relevant one when it comes to limitation, specifically in the case of protection, is that to analyze protection risk. Household survey data is not enough, and it's necessary to complement and triangulate this data. Um, I will briefly mention uh, what uh, or present you what we have tried to pilot this year when it comes to protection. So here um, I would like to outline a, a limitation that we have this year. As I mentioned before, um, for the MSNI, it's important that each sector uh, use indicator based on a definition of need. At the beginning of the year, um, when when the indicator bank was developed, uh, we didn't have at the moment a definition of protection need, uh, but now we, we have to say that uh, the Global Protection Cluster have, together with the AORs, have developed one. So um, now we have one before or at the beginning of the year we didn't have. So we had to, uh, let's say, come up with uh, a definition or approximation to, uh, to, to this concept. 
Um, so here we present uh, the rationale of um, uh, what we have our country team ask to incorporate in the MSNA 2024. Uh, to explain why we have done so. Uh, so. so on the one hand, we have a group of questions on prevalence. On the other, we have a, several, um, a question on self-perceived risk. Um, and we um, took this uh, group, these two group of questions uh, to estimate needs. Uh, and then, as we mentioned before, we have other group of uh, questions that are mostly related to vulnerabilities and, and capacities for a more holistic analysis. Now, um, I think I mentioned already this. Probably the one, the, the point I haven't mentioned is that another limitation of MSNA and usually any any household survey is that intra-household source of threats cannot be included in any question. Even for the protection of risk that are present in, in the indicator bank, uh, let's say we are asking about uh, violence, uh, violence, we can ask only about violence in the community and we should be explicit about that, but not uh, in the household. And here we map the questions uh, that were available in the indicator bank from 2024 uh, on both prevalent self-assess uh, risk against the 15 uh, protection risk. Um, I don't have time right now to go through all of them, but um, I think this presentation is going to be uh, shared afterwards. Uh, and if you would like to uh, have a, a a discussion on this. Happy to take questions on uh, at the end of the session. Uh, but here I would like to show you on on which uh, protection risk we we have questions on uh, prevalence, and also to mention that um, even though we have we 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 think we can ask question to measure prevalence of only this protection risk, not any type of question to measure prevalence. Uh, is appropriate. Uh, an example is the one on child marriage. Uh, if we want to measure prevalence or have an approximation, at least, of uh, child marriage, uh, we cannot include that wording in the question. On the contrary, there is uh, there is another alternative that is um, estimating this by using civil uh, status data from uh, all the household members. Uh, and then, as you might have seen uh, this year, we including uh, self-assess uh, risk, and this uh, responds to our own internal research. So I want to be very clear on this. Uh, it's not necessarily um, uh, indicators that uh, the global protection cluster or at global level that are promoted, um, but um, I just wanted to mention what we tried to pilot for this year. It's pretty much uh, trying to identify uh, where pil uh, people perceive that they have been at risk in a given period of time. Uh, and this comes from a self-assessed uh, perception. Uh, this came from recommendations from the literature of fear of crime. So we have been doing some research on how to uh, frame this, this type of question to actually ground uh, the answer uh, from people uh, in their actual experiences by making people recalling a specific moment where they have been concerned. Uh, and this um, way of asking also allow us to have a sense of intensity of this concern. We were asking whether this has been a concern just once, several times, multiple times, uh, or always. Um, and finally, um, important to, to outline what is the criteria for protection indicators, uh, not only in MSNAs, but in general. Uh, we try to avoid two sensitive questions on personal experiences. Uh, due to retraumatization, intra-household issues, and power dynamics, and also indicators that uh, will lead to misinterpretation, uh, uh, either because we ask for community-level phenomenon to household as if they were a key informant, 
with the assumption that they are aware of we, what we are asking. Um, and also when there is a potential over, of uh, over reporting of a phenomena. I will stop here. I know that we are uh, quite uh, late. I will skip the examples, um, but I would like to close here uh, with, with your question and feedback on how can we actually um, improve our work to better fit your needs. Um, so the floor is, is all yours. Thank you very much on my side uh, to the three of you. I mean, great presentation. Colleagues, maybe we can take five, 10 minutes. If there is any burning question, please raise your hand or place it in the chat. If there is no any question, can I otherwise ask a round of thumb up in Teams? So even if we are beyond time, amazing as is, please come in. Uh, good afternoon. Sorry, I missed the first part of the the, uh, the meeting, the discussion. I just wanted to ask if we are supposed to use this new methodology, the new calculation, when we are working for for next year's uh, HRP. If you could clarify this one, thank you. So. Uh, I, I guess you refer to the methodology for MSNA 2024. Um, yes, if yes. I, great, yes. Uh, no, this is, as I mentioned, a pilot. Um, we, uh, as, I, as we also mentioned uh, before, uh, we start working recently with the uh, GPC and AORs to actually uh, converge into a methodology uh, that is better suited for your needs. So. Um, this definition of protection needs that was recently coined by uh, or is being in, in the process of of, um, of definition, um, what is a uh, need or person in need of protection assistance. And based on uh, this definition, we will try to adjust our methodology for next year. Thank you. Maybe I compliment. Thank you, Fausto. I think you answered perfectly. Now, as is, um, one of the work we're doing together with Rich at the global level is, as uh, Fausto was saying, we will share as a cluster and AUR next week the harmonization of data and information based on the definition of needs that we're going to use for the HNO 2025. And I think that at the moment, the best process is when you engage with Rich colleagues in the field and in operation, please reach out to me and Fausto. So we can actually look at each single situation and see how we can adapt this year. The goal is basically to use the lessons learned of this year to harmonize much better between reach and the overall approach of the cluster for 2025. Thank you, loud and clear. Pleasure, Thank Aziz. You. Colleagues, any other questions? Or feedback? Uh, Fausto, maybe I have one question until we wait for the colleagues. Um, you know that we are, I mean, we are working together quite extensively these last past months on how to actually improve, and improve together. And one of the things that we're looking at as a protection sector is how to do better and much more structured value, of ju value judgment and convergence of evidence, as you know. And um, I was wondering, what is your general approach in the MSNA or in the other processes to actually not not verify or validate but at least to have an expert judgment of the data that you collect with the protection sector and uh, or if you have suggestion this year on the way we can do it better no that that's a great question and that's actually i think oh i think we lost fausto Hello. Now you're back. Now you're back. Okay. Sorry. Um, sorry. Uh, to recap. Um, yeah, I think it's a it's a limitation that uh, generally speaking, key informants approach usually have is how much to rely on just one person point of view, what that point of view actually represents, whether there are like some uh, interest behind or not. 
Um, and what I can mention in this regard is the validation study that the, um, let's say the HSM team is uh, undertaking right now on the methodology, uh, AOK methodology that was presented before by, by Soledad. Um, it's a it's a huge limitation that that the I will say the methodology itself it, it has, uh, and that's something that we are working on on how to better you know enhance uh, this approach. One um, solution, for example, uh, of course it depends a lot on on the nature of the question, uh, but uh, one solution is uh, for example asking to different type or different profiles of key informant or uh, experts. Uh, and try to triangulate that information, and based on uh, also uh, the the type of answer that they have is how you treat the the final result, the aggregation. Uh, so, for example, if you have three um, uh, expert judgment that three that you ask uh, independently, and they all uh, answer in the same direction, uh, then you can aggregate that answer and have some level of re reliability. However, when you have some contradictory um, uh, answers, uh, there you have either um, you assess, so you have another, let's say, variable to, to assess a, um, uh, the information that is the level of reliability of, of the data. Uh, like, for example, the IPC uh, usually have, you have data sources, but then you also assess the uh, reliability of data. Uh, or you decide on whether or not to use that information if, if you see that there is not agreement. But um, I think uh, probably when this validation study from the AOK methodology that is being um, undertaken by the HSM team, uh, that's something that maybe we can share with, with, uh, with all of you because I think we can learn a lot on, on how to treat this data. Amazing. If I can have a follow up, um, it might be interesting for us to follow up at global level, Fausto, um, since uh, um, basically our protection cluster colleagues and AUR will start now the data landscaping for 2025 HNOs. And as you know, we have been revising the approach in order to choose those areas of the country where we can do more value judgment because there is no access or areas where actually there is available data. There may be one. Uh, uh, concrete stuff that we could discuss to find a way to do is an early engagement between rich teams and protection cluster teams in order to maybe pace that value judgment uh, uh, exercise. Because we are going to organize a different country session of value judgment, so maybe we can actually use those to incorporate some of the data and that you collect and analyze you collect. But we can follow up maybe a global level. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a it's a great point, and yes, for sure, we should uh, seek to to have this level of engagement. So, if there is no other question, for the sake of time, we are like seventeen past the time. Um, we will share, if uh, as Fausto say, we will share the presentation um, after this and the recording. We will also upload it in the dedicated web page that we have in the Global Protection Cluster, so you will find it there. And uh, otherwise, thank you, Fausto. I was actually asking you if you can put, pull uh, your email. Uh, please feel free uh, to actually get in touch with Fausto and I uh, and Kashir when he's back for any question and answer. I mean, the bottom line is we have been increasing our engagement together with each and other data providers at global level in order to find way to streamline um, the processes and the new revised joint analysis approach that we have been discussing for the last seven months. So on my side, just thanking Rich. Thank you, everybody, and over to you, uh, Lisa, just to close the session. Oh, I'm just going to press N, so thanks, everyone, and um, yeah, I'll be in touch. Have a lovely rest of the day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.